First of all, I'd like to know how many of you really believe that this gas called CO2, some people call it satanic gas, can be really dangerous for the, for the climate and for the whole planetary Earth itself. How many of you? Zero? Y'all can go home now. <laughs> anyway, uh, the first disclaimer is that I truly speak here on my own behalf. You know, so I won't speak on behalf of even my wife or things like that, but uh, it's only strictly my own opinion because my workplace is putting very strong constraint on where I should speak. In any case, but I am a scientist. I've been working in this subject, I would say, day in and day out. You can ask my wife for, t for some 27 plus years. And I really are very serious. All I'm concerned about is actually the truth, yeah. as you know. Because we all know that if you speak about something that look like white color and then you call it black or gray, maybe it's not quite white, or two plus two is not, it's maybe, maybe four. No, it's not maybe, it's exactly four. Okay, if you try to play that kind of game, you're gonna die. <laughs> so let me start by giving you the take home messages, please. By the way, if some of you are sleepy, please still put on your seatbelt because, you know, it might be turbulence at time. <laughs> the, the very first point is that you can clearly say this. There is simply no experimental data. In science, it's all about experimental data. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are or how, how great your idea is or how nice you are, that kind of stuff. It's what the data say, okay? So, no experimental data exists to support the view that the Earth climate will be, is very strange or anomalous in the sense that it's unusual so that it will be changing in some dangerous way in which that you're all gonna die and, you know, according to God, we should have been dead uh, years ago, right? And they keep pushing the deadline until 2030, next one will be 2100. Believe me, these people are playing this game so long now, they even predict 100,000 years ahead of us. So it's really crazy. So what you need to know about CO2, by the way, any of you know what, what is CO2 gas? No, no, I don't intend you to answer. <laughs> right here, CO2, okay? This is gas of life. So if they want to tell you that CO2 is dangerous, you tell them to stop breathing, right? <laughs> <coughs> A very important point to remember is that CO2 indeed, we will explain, is a greenhouse gas, although the terms is very bad. This is another way that they try to conquer us by conquering the language first. They own the language. So unfortunately, on a normal parlance, allow me to say that, okay, it's a greenhouse gas, right? But exact physics, we, can, we are able to explain. Believe me, you will be able to understand because you know why? You are smart enough, you are really, if you pay attention, you will be able to learn anything you want to learn. Never ever let them tell you that, oh, it's too difficult. That's the usual stuff they're trying to hide all this simple stuff from you. But the main takeaway message, the second one is actually CO2 is just a big player in the climate change, okay? And the idea that you have this CO2 control knob in the climate system, it's a pure illusion. So let me give you that picture, it's very clear. Every time they say CO2 is dangerous, guess what you ask them? Where do you think the knob should be at? Do you guys know how much CO2 they claim to be outside the air? It's about 400 parts per million. That's basically four cents out of your $10,000, right? And then, do you know how much you're actually breathing out? It's 40,000 parts per million. That's part of the reason, right? If they want to argue it that way, you just say, should I stop breathing? <laughs> so there is just no CO2 control knob in the climate system that allow you to adjust this up and down. In fact, I was the few privileged one to ask Mr. Vice President Gore himself. Unfortunately, this is a closed door meeting. It's one of those rent seeking meeting at the Wall Street Journal conference where I believe the video exists, but unfortunately, none of you have ever seen it. I wish somebody would release that video someday. It's about me asking him the question, right? Where do you want the CO2 not to be? What if you are gonna cause the ecological disaster if you say that you know, CO2 is harming the planet? Because we all know what CO2 is. CO2 is plant food. In fact, it's even beneficial for marine animal, okay? Marine life, they say that CO2 is causing ocean to acidify, it's gonna kill all the ocean life. That is completely untrue, okay? Just try to learn the subject and try to catch the phrase word. So absolutely there's no such thing as CO2 control now. Now, because we are in a constitutional class, I mean, I truly admire this uh, 
justices of Supreme Court that passed away, Antonin Scalia. In fact, this is actually related to Massachusetts, by the way. Massachusetts lead this lawsuit, but actually this is all sue and settle kind of usual situation. If some of you want to know what sue and settle mean, it's just basically a broken system. Gangster suing gangster, right? Massachusetts versus EPA. This is a law case that decided on April 2nd, April Fool's Day in 2007, in which we have a 5-4 decision where all the state essentially won the case in which that uh, they would demand the US EPA to regulate the air, regulate CO2 because they claim that CO2 is an air pollutant. Truly outrageous. This is the one that is truly outrageous because scientifically, biologically, whatever you want to define it, CO2 could never be an air pollutant. This is why Antonin Scalia says this. If you want to consider CO2 to be an air pollutant, then you might as well consider frisbee and fatulence, right? <laughs> to be an air pollutant, pollutant. So this really defies the common sense, okay? It shows you that inside. Then you can have an update. Even our current justices who reported this in a, in a talk in uh, Claremont Colleges in uh, California recently in February 14 this year, he actually said that carbon dioxide is, is not going to be a pollutant. I'm sorry, you know? A pollutant is a subject that is harmful to human being or animal. This is another one of those things that they created, this myth that is actually going to cause asthma, so on and so forth. These are people who actually taking money from our taxpayer money, running the enrichment, which means they put the CO2 very high in the lab, and then guess what they are growing? You guys want to make a guess? Not corn, not wheat, not all this stuff. Rag wheat. They're trying to prove that this will cause us more asthma. Ridiculous. This is the kind of experiment that should never have been done. It's a waste of money, put it that way. So, please be assured that CO2 is not an air pollutant. These are not my saying. This is actually two Supreme Court justices. And then as, as it comes to my own work, the third point is that, guess what? The power of the sun is truly huge. Do you guys know that the, the Earth itself produces basically, how much power do we produce? We actually got no power at all. We, the only power that we have is actually from radioactive decay. And that is basically only like maybe some zero percent of the energy that actually been given up by the Earth. Large part of the energy on Earth is all 99.9% .9 is all given by the sun. And then they were trying to argue that the sun couldn't be driving the climate change. This is part of my research for 27 years. It's a very difficult subject, by the way. You cannot just claim, raise your hand and claim because, you know, I, want, I like the sun, I have to say that. No, no, no. It's about facts. So follow the evidence. I will show you near the end why is it so, right? That's the whole point. And then in science, there's another lesson I want to teach everyone, especially for the younger audience. It's in the sense that, you know, you can never prove an hypothesis to be right. You can only prove it to be wrong in that sense. It's a double negative. It's very unfortunate, but science is very rigorous. This is a statement that if you remember what Professor Albert Einstein ever said, is that no amount of evidence could prove me right. It just takes one single evidence to prove me wrong, right? That's a very deep kind of a sentiment about science, which we must always keep alert. So my basic point about this is that basically we have enough evidence to prove that CO2 is, is just not any driver of climate change. I'm so sorry, right? And then one more point that is very important to remember is that a lot of this fear mongering, these things that to make you scared, you know, polar bear gonna die, so on and so forth, sea level gonna rise, and then New York City gonna be taken over, New Orleans, whatever, what have you. If this thing were to be true, I would have to say that I will report to you tonight that yes, it's true. Unfortunately, close to just about everything they say is all wrong. And the large part of how they, they deduce that information or that statements is all come from something called climate model. Okay? Climate model is this big computer program algorithm that basically still have a lot of problem in a sense because they couldn't represent something as simple as water. Yes, water, right? Because we are a water planet, don't you know? That's why we look so blue, right? And we have solid, liquid, and gas form. These are the real, real difficult problem in terms of representing it in a climate model so that you actually can predict the future, right? And then this is what I call the, this is constitute the GIGO effect because GIGO effect, people usually say is garbage in, garbage out. Your arm is in the way of the chart. Can you move over a little bit? Okay, okay. sure. Good. But the way you should see, see this about climate model is that basically it's 
garbage in, gospel out. This is the danger of the thing, right? Because if you were to garbage in, garbage out, I'm not going to worry because it's garbage. The problem is that they make this garbage and then they say it's some kind of gospel from alcohol, right? So it's a very, very dangerous proposition. And then finally, as a person who cares about science so much, because the future is really very, very important. It's totally corrupted to the point where even our nation's highest, uh, quote-unquote, stature in science will be National Academy of Science, right? You would think that National Academy of Science will have some integrity about science, isn't it? Unfortunately, even that is 100% corrupted. It's not 99, 100%. That's how bad things are, okay? I hope I can shed some light on all these topics. Before we go any further, there's something also, another stuff that they usually trap you into sort of believing that something is bad is going on. By the way, I see some hand raising, please. Perhaps that we can talk about that, you know, after the talk. That would be a lot better because it's much easier that way. <clears throat> the first thing I want to discuss here is basically about this so-called renewable energy. Can you guys give some example of renewable energy? Okay, go ahead. Right, yeah, well, that's what they call, yes? Okay? And then I wanted to explain to you all this myth about the, all this renewable energy being something that is capable of uh, powering the earth. But I think you have learned by now from, from this camp, especially from uh, John McManus, this is all about control, isn't it? It's essentially trying to demonize this molecule, this gas of life. Again, remember, you are breathing this out in huge amount of concentration. And they essentially want to tax the air, right? These two guys, I hope you know them. One of them is David Suzuki from Canada. And then the other one, of course, is the famous singer from uh, Canada. Sorry, he's the Prime Minister of Canada. Same thing. The quote here is basically to tell you that these are, these are the people like, I, like most of you have seen in other areas, they are not afraid. They actually are saying that this is not about climate, this is not about science, okay? You'll be very foolish and naive because this is all about distribution of wealth. This person by the name of uh, Otmar uh, Adenhofer from uh, Germany, he's the high level IPCC official. He clearly says that, you know, you have to free yourself from the illusion that all these international climate policies or treaties and so on and so forth is actually about environmental policy. This has nothing to do with policy. This is about themes of globalization, right? You have heard about Agenda 21 too, probably in this sort of a lecture. And then the former Canada's uh, Minister of Environment, Christine Stewart, essentially also make it very, very clear this is all about justice, about equality in the world, right? A lot of this concept, by the way, it's just very, very difficult to, to define very well. The ugly sad facts about energy is that if you don't have energy, a lot of people die, put it this way. What we really need to start a movement is essentially to say that we need to have abundant, cheap, affordable energy. Really, really cheap, dirt cheap, put it that way. In fact, some of these big institutions like uh, Bill Gates, whatever, these people who are trying to say that they should use solar cooker, they should use this $100 computer, I always tell them, why don't you use it first? They are assuming people in Africa, people in India, all these poor people shouldn't be able to use all these things. They should really use everything that we, should, we are using, actually. To me, that's basically what it is about, principle of life. So no energy is as dirty as no energy. This is a very profound statement by my friend Alex Epstein. And a very important statistic you should remember is this. If you tax an energy, okay, you are essentially trying to punish the poor, for being, punish people for being poor. Because from the chart here, you can see, depends on your income, from less than 20,000 to 120,000 or more, this is showing you the proportion of your income is being used for energy, heating your home, air condition, and so on and so forth. You can see the lowest one, it's up to 40% of your income is basically used for that sort of thing. So who's gonna benefit really, Al Gore? Of course he's benefit when, when you play this game, right? And then people keep saying about the oil and the coal and all this company are being subsidized so heavily. These are the, these are the real facts. The solar and the wind one are the ones that are being heavily subsidized. The ratio, you can do it for yourself, right? 50 cents to $230, right? That's over 500 times, okay? If they want to argue that, you always try to remind them about this sort of thing, okay? Because it's just 
Facts is very important. Those people, by the way, I really encourage them if they want to use solar power. Please use all you want, but please don't take any of the subsidy. Be honest. Use it. And this is the one. The, another one that the myth is always is that, oh, this renewable, they are the fastest growing jobs. They are securing more clean energy job. This is another one of those clean energy jobs you can get. <laughs> of course, winter is not enough, so you need summer too, right? Summer you can do that, cut some grass or clean some dust actually. In fact, the latest paper just came out last week was to say that, you know, they have to clean this thing every two months, but they still lose 30% of the energy, right? So they're really a very good job. If you guys may have learned, learned about this economic principle, right? You just hire somebody to get a rock and just keep throwing glasses, right? And then you just keep renewing and the, the glass industry will be really, really prosperous, okay? This is a zero-sum game, boy. <laughs> and then the wind energy is the same. It's terrible, actually, a lot of these things. They, they degraded very quickly and they got all kinds of problems. And then there are guys like this, Elon Musk. I'm sure you heard of him, right? He produced this Tesla. Produce all this fake, fake actually, fake charging station that nobody uses actually. It costs so much that only he himself can afford it, right? This is silly. And then they never ask where the electricity is going to come from, by the way. They say that you should drive an uh, electric car. Sure, I like to drive an electric car if it's affordable. This is why I guess the great word from uh, Albert Einstein is that there are only two things that is infinite. It's the universe and human stupidity, right? <laughs> it's a very... True statement, actually. <laughs> and then uh, a week ago, another paper just came out. There is even paper now proposing that even the bats as a species may suffer extinction because they are killing so much of the bats. Okay? And these are the so-called environmentalists, right? They really have never been out there that, that much, I think. They should go out more often and do more camping. <laughs> And then you want to hear some fiasco from Massachusetts. We are in New Hampshire, which most of us are from Massachusetts. You all know that on January 20th, the big day, guess what they were doing? They were issuing press release saying that Massachusetts is going to go 100%, not 99.9%, 100% no, .9 renewable energy. I cannot believe that we're actually electing these people. <laughs> to, uh, I mean, this is really a joke. I mean. It, do you guys really believe in it? Please raise your hand if you believe that you can get 100% renewable energy. What does it mean, actually? And we are electing them to say that we're going to have, what did they say? They say that we're going to have 100% renewable electricity by 2035. Okay? And then we're going to have phase out complete use of fossil fuel across every sector, including heating and transportation by 2050. Unbelievable. This is the kind of a wastage. But they forgot to tell you. There are some very raw facts that it's just not going to change over time very quickly. If you look at the total energy consumption over time, okay, most of it is supplied obviously by coal, oil and gas. Can you see the green line at the bottom for wind and solar? That's the thing they forgot to tell you. By the way, just two weeks ago, somebody here, Christine White from uh, MIT, the president of MIT actually wrote a a very silly kind of thing as soon as uh, President Trump uh, get rid of the Paris uh, Climate Accord. He wrote a letter saying that this solar and wind energy was the fastest growing thing. I got really dizzy and headache that I got a group of my friends and we actually wrote a letter back to him and tell him all the, <laughs> tell him to back off. And then he started to tell us that science is about consensus. That's the president of uh, MIT, okay? So now I'm thinking twice, man, in, in case you, you want to go to MIT. <laughs> but there is something very basic that you should learn. Every time when they talk about energy, you should ask this simple question. What is important about energy, by the way? It's actually this quantity called energy density. Okay? Either measure in terms of uh, energy per volume or per weight. The problem is a lot of this stuff about wind, solar, biomass, and all this other stuff is that it has extremely low energy density. Even batteries and all those guys that are at the lower corner, you have all these other guys, gasoline and diesel, they're way up there. Okay? It's about energy den density. All this stuff are energy that is too diffuse. You just can't use it properly. You can never reach 100% that way. Okay? They forgot to tell you, every time you have a wind and solar power, you have to build a coal generator like uh, using natural gas to supply the electricity in case these things are not working at night. 
In fact, they are pumping in Spain. They cheat so much that they are pumping diesel at night to generate solar power. They, and then they get subsidy money. This is how bad things are actually, okay? All over the world they're doing things like this. And this chart is the same chart, but I want to show you in larger scale. Look at nuclear. People are so scared of nuclear, but they are the highest energy density. This is about a billion order higher. And they are trying to scare everybody off from using safe use of the nuclear energy. This is the kind of game that tells you that they really don't care about human life. They don't care about, they just don't care, put it this way. This is how bad things are, right? And then there's one more important point when they want to talk about renewable energy. This is a fact that you cannot change because history is history. For over 200 plus years, guess what we're doing? By the way, this chart is showing you the percent of renewable energy that we've been changing over the last 200 years. Long, long time ago, when we haven't even discovered coal, we're using wood, right? We're burning use, we're using 100% renewable energy. And this systematically, we find stuff like coal, we find like gasoline, you know, all this stuff, and nuclear. We're actually going away from this renewable energy. Now they want us to go back. Think about that, okay? This is why this quote from this professor, uh, this Scottish professor, Professor Colin McInnes, is very useful. He said that every time we have a new fuel, new fuel, a new form of energy that we're using, we're going towards higher energy density, not towards lower, which is all this fake renewable, right? So this is the energy that really going to, unfortunately, what they are trying to propose to you is that it's going to be more and more and more and more and expensive. In fact, it's just an impossible thing. It has nothing to do with the revolution, actually. I always try to say this is some kind of revolution. In fact, it's a pure regression, right? Both in the economics and, and our mental mind, actually. You turn into a midget if you believe in that. So, please, you all can read English, right? Can we read this line? What we have here is a very clear situation. This is a quote, actually, by a person by the name of Michael Hart. He wrote a book called Hubris. I like this statement because he said, the politician are throwing money that they do not have at a problem that does not exist in order to finance a solution that makes no difference. <laughs> oh, aren't we proud of these people, right? I mean, I really want to cry when I read this sort of statement. You know, these people can still smile. Finally, I want to come back now to science about explaining what it's all about, right? The ultimate thing that really, really kills science will be that if you start using the word consensus, actually. Mentally, actually, I would try to slap all of them, really. You should never ever say that, including President of MIT. Put it on the record. Then I want to invoke a good man, Galileo Galilei. You all have learned about Galileo Galilei, right? Telescope and that sort of thing, finding Jupiters, you know, the moon around Jupiter and things like that, right? Studying sunspot, all that stuff. In science, Galileo Galilei say, in question of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. That means you, 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 you. Please. This is what... Part of my reward for being a scientist is that I felt very free. I felt very happy, actually. Because you know why? I don't have to be hurt like a sheep. I think I have my own mind. I have my free will. I may not get paid much, but you know what? I have the freedom to think. Think for myself. To understand. To understand the beauty of the natural world that is surrounding us, right? This is what is so beautiful about science. So now I want to ask a very simple question. What is climate? And then we're going to study this carbon dioxide, okay? Within this context of energy flow in the climate system, okay? It's really not that complicated. By the way, there will be no equations in this talk. Do not worry, but there will be quizzes. When they speak about greenhouse gas, I want to ask a question. Do you guys know that what is the number one greenhouse gas in the climate system? Now you can answer if you, if you know. Yes, oxygen. go ahead. Oxygen, oxygen is not a greenhouse gas because it uh, is, can be passed by the infrared radiation. So it's not. What is the number one greenhouse gas? That's good, now you have a chance to learn. Go ahead. Water vapor? That's right, water vapor, okay? So people say that carbon dioxide is important in the climate system, you say no, it's actually water vapor. But water in all the form, okay? Because water can also form ice cloud and then you can have ice, you can have snow, you can have, you know, all kinds of stuff, including in addition to the vapor. 
Now I'm going to show you something very complicated, but it's actually very simple. Okay, this is all the different component. By the way, it's just a minimal summary, just a small amount. It's just basically a small representation of how the energy flow among the climate system, right? From ocean to the atmosphere, atmosphere back, and then different system, rainstorm. But if you ask yourself, if you ask in terms of CO2 and water vapor, okay, where do you think they are, they are controlling the system? For carbon dioxide and, and water vapor, they actually control the atmospheric conversation. Okay? And then if you ask yourself, what else does the water vapor or water component do in the climate system? You will see, they will be blue all over the place. They are controlling the perceptible water vapor. They are controlling relative humidity, precipitation, which is rain. They are controlling all of this. Let me click all of them so you see. They cover everything. And they're telling you that carbon dioxide is the most important gas in the climate system. Baloney. Yeah, if they dare to teach you that, you just say, I'm sorry, I have to walk out of your class and i like a refund. <laughs> I Actually, I'm that kind of troublemaker in school also. <laughs> I did ask for a refund because you know what? I'm not getting my money worth. My father worked hard for the money. So this is how these people are trying to do. You always see that they're showing stuff from the smokestack, right? As if that those things are bad. By the way, it's, up, it's so bad now, they actually manipulate the image. They try to make it a little bit darker. There are people who actually do and they got caught. And there's still no consequences. That's the way that the world that we live in now. We're so forgiving on this kind of stuff. There's no difference between this natural CO2, uh, H2O versus the man-made one, right? The one you burn from your, the plume coming out from, from your power plant. All the stuff that's coming out from the power plant is just mainly water vapor, okay? And to show you how important this water vapor is, you do have to talk about greenhouse effect, by the way. This is a map showing from 90 north to 90 south, and then this is the height from 0 to 20 kilometers. The top chart is showing you the temperature, the atmospheric temperature. Temperature is warm at the surface, and then it gets cooler and cooler near the top, which is from the troposphere to the stratosphere, right? These are the region between uh, uh, the, the Earth that you, you can have certain uh, temperature profile. And then if you ask yourself, how does the distribution of water vapor look like? It's just basically the area that is warm is just area that is highly concentrated in water vapor. When you have less water vapor, it's cooler. It is that simple, okay? And then there are people who are trying to tell you that, you know why? This, the, the reason why that in the summer when you roll up your window and you're sitting in the car and then it get hot is because that it's your CO2 that is causing the, <coughs> the temperature to be warming up in your car. This is the kind of guy. They are so-called educational, science educator. Okay? And they are saying, for example, he really says this. We're familiar with this effect of uh, carbon uh, greenhouse effect. Because when we sit in car in the sun, the interior becomes hot because of the carbon in the glass that keep the heat in. It's really embarrassing, by the way. He never retracted this. We re demanded a retraction, he never retracted this. And then we got another average D student by the name of John Kerry. Actually, he was feeling very strong because he went uh, in Jakarta, Indonesia. So he started to bash uh, uh, United States. And then he tried to explain to you that this greenhouse effect, you know what, it's actually a very thin layer of gas. He said it's about quarter, quarter of an inch. That's how thin it is. If you squeeze all the atmosphere down, you know, like 100 kilometers up, you squeeze all the thing down, it's actually about only a quarter of an inch. And then he started to contradict himself. He said, this blanket is going to grow thicker as you trap more heat. Quarter of an inch, and then if you add a little bit more CO2, how many more inches are you going to add? <laughs> I mean, he really doesn't know number. This is why all this average uh, D student is very embarrassing. This is why I posted this picture. You guys know left or right? Which one is the uh, manipulated image? Is it CO2? Is it an uh, illusion? Left. Left? Okay, let's see. It's that one. <laughs> you actually can play this game to any, any politician. You just switch the eye. <coughs> it's a very interesting manipulation. And then, of course, now he's saying that it's going to be refugee crisis coming in human history. Now that he's, uh, he's so bold. And then the sickening stuff is, of course, these are your peers. I hope that you know some of these people will be willing to... This is part of the reason why I want to speak up and want to show you some of this graph. By the way, please take your time to learn, right? Because you're not going to learn all of this 27 years in one day, right? So if you have any questions, please look out for us and look out for Hal, look out for Mr. Pike. 
back and then we can really try to help you uh, seek certain answer if you have any question at all. <coughs> so it's true. Another statement from Galileo Galilei, if you deny all these scientific principles, you can easily maintain infinite number of paradoxes, right? So to answer what is climate, this is just a brief summary. Climate, to understand climate, you need to know astronomy, solar physics, geology, geochronology, geochemistry, sedimentology, tectonic, paleontology, paleoecology, glaciology, climatology, meteorology, oceanography, ecology, archaeology, and history. Hopefully that uh, you all will study all of this tomorrow. <laughs> but the question is really simple. Science is not about me, I'm Ho Yiving. It's about what is actually happening, right? Did all this... By the way, we do know how to measure CO2, okay? First of all, let's see. The CO2 level, we have been measuring this very accurately from 1958 until now. It's been going from about 310 to about 400 now. Again, remember, 400 parts per million just simply means four penny out of your $10,000, right? Another way to do it is to think about this. In a Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl can sit about 100,000 people. The CO2 amount has been increased over the past decade, just the last 10 years, is actually 20 parts per million. That's equal to two parts per 100,000. That just means that uh, this is equivalent to packing two more people in a Rose Bowl. In 10 years, I have heard a, a very interesting comedy joke, comedian saying this. If the sea level is gonna rise by four inches in the next 100 years, and you don't know how to step back, you deserve to die. <laughs> Again, I told you that CO2 is very high concentration in the human respiration, right? Here's a measurement. Normal breath, you have about 40,000 or more. Al Gore, he usually holds his breath for a long time, so I hope he holds longer. You can actually make it to 80,000 parts per million. And how much is outside? 400, right? 400, so it's a thousand more, thousand times more. This is why it's so ridiculous for them to try to say that CO2 is a pollutant. And then again, it's, it's about experiment. Science is all about experiment. This is a chart that's showing you two collection of 280 experiments, 279, showing you three sets of experiments. You grow your plants under 300 parts per million, and then currently it's about 400 or 600, and then a 1,350. And then the blue curve is actually so-called non-stress, meaning that in this experiment, you just give it water, you give it sunlight, you give it everything. But in the top one, you try to make it more similar to the real world in the laboratory. So you give it you know, a bit of a stress, which means you don't have to supply all the water that it wants. So this is much more realistic. What it's trying to tell you here is that CO2 level today, we are in a CO2 starvation. Why would you want to take the CO2 and then put it in the ground? That's what they are proposing, by the way. They created crazy notion called clean coal, by the way. Should they go, go, go and take a shower? I don't think so. This is why it's so mad. This is what I actually, this is the chart that I asked Al Gore. Are you going to be responsible for all the ecological crisis if you want to lower CO2 level? Who are you to do that? You're going to pay? So he's very mad. Actually, he wasn't able to answer that question. He said he wanted to save the human civilization. I say, me too. <laughs> so here's a picture. These are actual experiments. By the way, does anybody, please, I hope you learn a little bit about science in, in your class. You know what experiment means, yes? Mm -hmm. Can somebody spell out what experiment means? Go ahead. It is a scientific test um, that you subject to see what will happen uh, when, you, when you subject something to something that has not been tested. Quite good. So if, let me ask you, if this guy that is raising hand, if he do the same experiment you do, do exactly the same, should he get the same result? Yes. Yes, indeed. No, in I fact, in fact but Franklin can do it. <laughs> this is very important. You can go and do this. It's very simple, right? Look at the growth. If you have more CO2, it's clearly the, even the root system is growing better. By the way, the CO2 starvation is actually what these people are proposing. They want to go down to 200 parts per million. Are you joking? I mean, even a pic, this is why they never want you to see pictures like this. By the way, these are pictures from uh, Sherwood Itzo. From his son, gave it to me, yeah. They, were, they, they run all this kind of experiment. Known, botany know these sort of things for a long, long time. Let me skip this one. It's just, 
This is why we are actually trying to grow plant in a greenhouse. We, in fact, we have this kind of generator. It's, it's buying propane. The main cause of CO2 is actually we want to have more CO2, so we, we use propane to do that in the greenhouse so you can grow your tomato and cucumber and all this stuff in the winter, right? Canada, I, I don't have the exact statistic, but in two, year 2000, the statistic is that for all this kind of greenhouse growing, it's of the order of billion dollars industry. I mean, you cannot fool people, you know, it's just so silly to try to say that CO2 is so bad. And then this is why they are proposing all this silly stuff. They say that they need to build about a few millions of this thing to capture the carbon dioxide from all the, all the stuff going. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, I, I'm going to skip this because this greenhouse effect is very, very interesting, but it's from a scientific paper. But I want to point out to the model. In this war now, it's so dangerous that I want you to pay attention on this. There's this guy, I call him Reverend. He's probably, he's not a real Reverend. It's partly a joke. His name is Jim Hansen. He's from NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study. These are the people now is proposing statement like this. The model is right. If the evidence is not agreeing with the model, it is not the evidence that is uh, wrong. It is right. It's actually the model is right, but the, the world is wrong. So you have to clear your eye again. Poke your eye out, make sure that you see this. Here's the evidence. In 2000, this is how the US temperature history looked like from about 1880 to 2000. So it go up and it was very warm in the 30s and the 40s, and then it cools off. And then in 2000, he realized that the, the warm in the 1990s are not as high as the 1930s and 1940s. So he was drawing that line. He was concerned. Okay? He said that, well, in the US, there's been little temperature change in the past 50 years. The, part, the time of rapidly increasing CO2. Because that was a hypothesis. CO2 is rising very rapidly in the last 50 years, yet the temperature is cooling. So they have some contradiction, right? You would think that they would then accept that, okay, CO2 is not that powerful, isn't it? No, that's not what they do. Guess what they did? The actual measurement looked like this on the blue. And this is the, the, the orange line is actually what they have done to the data set now. They actually manipulated the data. They pulled this thing down. Do you think that this is acceptable? Do you think that I draw this out of the air, I just want to paint them as some kind of devil? Uh-uh, this is actual stuff they're doing. That's how crazy these things are. And then this is the current director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study. He's the guy who's responsible for producing all this data. Instead of giving me the good data, he tried to say that we have to put a price on carbon. This guy is really crazy, actually. That's why I say, some of my friends from this NASA retiree group, these are the people, by the way, these are the great generation of our, uh, you know, of human history. These are the people who send a man, you know, from here to the moon and bring them back safely, okay? This is all the retiree. They call the right climate stuff. These are all my friends in Houston. They always start their meeting by saying, in God we trust, all other brace bring your data. <laughs> and you all heard that 2016 is the warmest year ever? Have you heard of that? Right? And guess what happened? This is the map they show you. Oh, red is warm. Blue is cool. It's red all over the place. I think Franklin could make this kind of drawing. Okay? The reason why I, I joke about this is that it's really crazy. This is not true. Look at the actual data available on the land. I flip back for you to see. Look, the actual data, the gray part, it means that they have no data. How come it's all red? This is what you call science. They actually interpolated the data. So I'm showing you the red re the, the yellow region where all the high red region, those are the places where they don't have data. It's all from interpolation, okay? This is why you need to go to school to learn some of these techniques. These are not serious stuff. These people are not producing any data. They actually imagine it comes from an algorithm, which is a big difference. And then in fact, just a few weeks, a week or two ago, this friend of mine from Germany found out that uh, they, they actually reported that in 1995, the global temperature was 15.4 degrees. And then today it's 14.8 degrees. Is that global warming? I don't want to confuse you. The problem is that these people don't even know where the global, global temperature is, okay? And then if you want to follow the history, they have the number, put it this way. No one had the exact number of what the global temperature is. It's arbitrary. It's a very difficult scientific measurement. And they haven't done that yet. And they're telling you that globe is the warmest ever. 
So I forget why I put this part. He was giving a medal to himself. <coughs> oh, how come this is still in here? Oh, the prophet. I'll go. Yeah, he, he now not so interested in Christianity. He said that now he's going to gonna cause all the problem in uh, Islam in, in Mecca. That this heart is so hot that it's going to kill everybody there. Don't pray. Don't pray. <coughs> so I want to point out another trick that is very popular because this is in the IPCC report. This is supposed to be the most important report ever come out from the universe. IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. How many of you have heard of it before? No one? Okay, only one or two. These are from United Nations, by the way. You all heard a lot of bad things about United Nations, but this is another one of the very big reasons why United Nations, we should get rid of it. So this is what IPCC is telling you. They are telling you that on your left, that you have a measurement, which is the the black curve, and then the red curve is what the climate model can produce. Wow, these people are really smart because you know what? They can produce exactly what you're measuring, roughly, right? And then they say that on the right-hand side, if you include only the sun and the volcano, you're going to have a discrepancy. But if you add CO2, it agrees very well. Are you guys totally confused yet? Sometimes I felt I'm very confused, but unfortunately I've been tracking this thing for a long time, so don't even wink it. Here's the problem. The actual comparison that they did, they should show you this particular curve, because that's exactly the same thing. The one that you see before, and this one that you see now, is exactly the same result, same information. Except they use a trick called temperature anomalies. Whereas if you measure in terms of absolute temperature, by the way, you don't melt your eyes because the temperature is is the temperature anomaly, or you froze your eye, the temperature anomaly is zero. It's because absolute temperature is zero, or something, right? So absolute temperature is very important. The measurement is in the black curve. The model curve is all, the, all over the place. They don't know where the global temperature is. That's the kind of trick that they're doing. If you want to understand what's the difference between absolute and the anomaly, you just look at this station from Russia. The red curve is measuring temperature from minus 50 to plus 20. Okay? A difference of about 70 degrees Celsius fluctuating. It's fluctuating because of the season, right? The sun coming and going. And the, the red, the, the, the green curve is actually the anomaly, the difference. If you take a mean of this thing, you just reduce all the changes very, into a very, very small proportion. By the way, these are the stuff that contain in the US EPA. Okay? US EPA. When they were copying the IPCC, which is a temperature anomaly plot, to make it look like they are the same, they started to add absolute temperature in there, which means these people who did the work didn't know that where all those data come from. They were very, very confused. So it is actually still in the EPA webpage several year, uh, two years ago, before President Trump got elected. Now I want to tell you, if you think that this climate model can do something, I want to invite you to think about this. By the way, Another very typical thing that they're trying to intimidate most of us is basically to say that, wow, well, you have how many Nobel Prize, how many thousand scientists agreeing this and that, right? One of the typical things is that they invite somebody from a Nobel Prize, yes, they are legitimate Nobel Prize in this case, is the Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Professor Robert Kerr from Rice University, who makes statement like this, that the sobering conclusion about future warming, which is about dangerous future warming, are based on elaborate model of the Earth. They say that we're not talking about one scientist model, but we have a number of this program that gave the same result. For this kind of answer, I invite you to think about this. I want to ask you this question. This is a 16 passenger jet, okay? You can actually do the averaging. What do you think the average passenger jet of this one look like? And would you fly on these things, okay? You take this, Pixel by pixel, you can add the image up, look at what it looks like. <laughs> Very fuzzy, nice. isn't it? This is our image mani manipulation, right? You just check it out. Are you going to fly on that? Maybe we should send Elgo on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of this computer model, I would say, give me a faster computer, I'll give you the wrong result a lot sooner. <laughs> now I'm coming almost near the end. I'm going to talk about the sun now. Oh, by the way, I have, I'm a very simple-minded person. You, don't you think that the first thing that we can ask about climate model, if they say it's so powerful, can do this and do that, right? 
can the climate model do the seasonal cycles very well on the planet Earth, uh, let's say in the northern hemisphere? Here's all the simulation, all the data from about 24 climate models all over the place. You're measuring something called the, the amplitude and this is the lag, the phase of the seasonal cycle. And you ask yourself, where is the measurement? It's right there. Not a single model come even close to it, okay? You might as well just close your eyes and throw dots if you want to use climate model to give you the answer, right? So it's a very bad thing. And then finally, science get more and more silly. The other day, this group from Columbia University trying to be cute to say that they're gonna, they're gonna issue this kind of chart to try to talk about whether your, your, your dog will have your, the paw to be wet or not, depends on the season. This is the kind of stuff that is really getting worse and worse and worse and worse. This is not science at all. This is really has nothing to do with anything. This is why I want to remind us about what Ben Franklin says on science, about producing useful knowledge, okay? This is a founder of uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, Ben Franklin, as you might, see, might know. He really called for that because he realized that the university around the world, even at that time, were already failing in terms of discovery and dissemination of useful knowledge, okay? That's why he proposed that the standard of science should be actually producing this thing called useful knowledge, which I like it very much. And the reason why is that, as I say, I don't like to be complaining all night long. This is work from my two colleagues, from uh, one from University of Pennsylvania by the name of Scott Armstrong, and Kirsten Green is from Australia. They just recently produced a, a paper that say guidelines for science to try to say that what should constitute science, okay? Good science, or useful, that produce useful knowledge. And that's the kind of stuff we should look into. And then I want to talk now about the scientific results that I produce myself. And this is work done with these two collaborators from uh, Ireland. Their name is Ronan and Michael Connolly. And they are very, very good scientists, by the way. And here I want to point your attention to the temperature curve. You have basically, I want you to focus on the red line. Look at what the temperature curve looked like according to them. The NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study. From 1880 to about 2010. It's going up, 1930 is warm, and then it cool a little bit, and then you say the zoom going up. And I try to propose to you that this warm at the last part is not real. It's caused by things called urban heat island effects and all this other instrumental problem. And I can show you the proof because I have looked into the temperature data record and we work with Ronan and we produce a different temperature record. And they are really indeed trying to scare people, right? We go about trying to get all the data It's available. You all know that the problem of measuring temperature, right? The temperature right here will be very different from temperature outside, isn't it? Or near the city or New York and that kind of stuff. It's all corrupted by basically all this human modification of the land use, right? Or building around the areas and so on and so forth. So we went through a very careful systematic study. We only take the rural station in all these places and we find, try to ask the question, what does the temperature record look like? Because if you go to the urban highland like New York, if you take the temperature, yeah, it's gonna look warm now, but it's not caused by climate at all. It's because the heat retained by the building that is causing the problem, isn't it? So you're not actually measuring climate. And we got a result. We went to China, we went to USA, Ireland, and Arctic Circle. And we produced this thing called the Northern Hemisphere Average, okay? Let me blow it up. It looks like this. Does it look the same like what they produced by the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study? No, right? Because they got the, the other end of it much, much warmer than 1930s and 1940s, right? And I'll skip this. I want to go to the bottom line about what is causing this temperature to change, okay? And I want to tell you that it's partly had to do with the sun. And uh, Another thing that it has to do is that this is part of my credibility. I have worked on this labor of love and to produce a book like this to try to explain the phenomenon of sunspot and coming and going, why is it so and so on and so forth. The bottom line is that most of the energy of the Earth system is powered by the sun. If you know to read number like 10 to the power of 26 watt versus 10 to the 17, you know that's a billion time. Okay? So there's just no comparison. And then now I want to show you a small video to tell you that uh, this is what, how we go about studying the sun. We use uh, all this telescope on board space 
Space, right? Of course. Oops. Ah, don't play that video. Anyway, this is how you collect all this information of the sun. You look at it from all different wavelengths. And ultimately, if you look at it, our temperature curve looks like this. Guess what the light red curve is? It's the best estimate of the solar energy output. It kind of fit, isn't it? Right? So this is the part of work that I've been doing with Ronan and uh, 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 Michael Connolly. And in fact, we published this result very recently. And then if you look at USA, guess how it looked like? It's kind of fit too, isn't it? So if they were to try to tell you that it is carbon dioxide that's causing the temperature to change in USA, I don't think so, right? And then finally, what is the real reason for the close relationship between the solar radiation and the, and the temperature change? I propose to you that it has something to do with the water vapor. So this is another new result that I just produced recently. And it's shown by the blue curve, the water vapor curve, and then the sun energy output is the red curve. It fits really reasonably well, OK? And I wrote this, uh, this, this chapter to honor this friend of mine, uh, Professor Bob Carter, who died suddenly. And I, I encourage everybody to look up this particular booklet that is coming out very soon, I think in another month or so. I think I'm almost done here now. Thank you.